Hi everyone, I'm Tim Morton. Thanks for taking the time to join me today. This webinar is Mastering the Art of Validating, looking at the role of validators in the Celo protocol and how the Celo proof of stake scheme um, allows validators to get elected, rewarded, and uh, slashed. So before we dive in, um, I just wanted to set the context for the webinar and for some logistics. Claire, I think, just mentioned uh, some of these things, so apologies if, I, if I'm repeating. The stake-off is going to begin on December the 4th. It's uh, a competition that will run on top of Backlover, our uh, incentivized, the Celo Event Incentivized Testnet. It helps anyone interested in becoming a potential uh, validator build operational experience, like learn more about the protocol and put in place good security practices and just generally helps the community building the Celo protocol to like further harden the software. And so, <clears throat> you know, subject to the stake off terms and conditions, we, um, we're we very excited about this. The top 50 teams on the leaderboard will have the opportunity to receive Celo Gold at mainnet launch and uh, that should be enough according to the current design to be able to put up a stake for one or more validators and validated groups. So this is really, if you're interested in validating uh, for the Celo mainnet, this is a great way not just to have a bit of fun, but to be able to uh, to be able to like uh, earn enough of that stake that you can go straight into that process as soon as as soon as mainnet starts. Um, yeah, and on top of that, during the stake off, there are sort of additional ways to receive mainnet Celo gold for helping the community. Um, you can contribute code, improve documentation, extend test coverage, or just help others participate in the community. So. There'll also be an AMA straight after this. Um, please post questions on the Cello forum. Uh, Claire will channel them or like ask ask them at the end if we've uh, if we've got time like live on on this session. And then uh, any others that we don't get to uh, today, we will uh, continue to answer like asynchronously on on the forum. Uh, at least I think that's the I think that's the arrangement. So yes, yeah, so those QR codes linked to link, link to that. And there's also going to be a second webinar as well, which Claire will be giving about the sort of logistics, the rules, the process, and more practical guidance for getting involved in the stake off as well. So that'll be on uh, Thursday, the fifth of December. All right. So uh, <coughs> let's get started. So we're going to touch on like mission and motivation. We'll look at Celo's like network topology. We'll dive into the proof of stake scheme and, and look at some of the uh, concepts around that. Um, how uh, Celo implements it through um, having Celo gold holders lock up gold. Um, validators are obviously the, um, the, the the machines that get elected to participate. Uh, groups are a new concept which we'll talk about. Um, and yeah, just how how, uh, how how that whole process works. We'll then go on and look at uh, how the Celo protocol incentivizes participation from all these actors, uh, and we'll look at how epoch rewards, which are Celo's form of block rewards, how how that will get calculated. Um, so penalties are, I guess, slashing is the way that the protocol disincentivizes certain behaviors. So we'll look at look at that. That's still a little bit work in progress. Um, but we'll cover what details we have there. And then finally, we look at like attestations, which is a uh, way that validators in Celo participate in Celo's identity protocol, uh, the mechanism by which users with a mobile phone number can verify that they have access to that phone number and thereby like receive payments directly through, uh, through it. Cool. So, <clears throat> yeah, before we um, before we dive into the technical details, I think it's important to start with uh, the purpose for which we, we the Celo protocol has been designed, and for which, like I, I at least uh, I'm, I'm working on it. Um, the Celo mission is to build a monetary system that creates the conditions of prosperity for all, and this starts for us by empowering anyone with a smartphone anywhere in the world to have access to sound currency be able to participate in um, basic financial services so and then to be able to do so through their phones so that means maintaining a balance sending money to friends and family via their phone numbers and being able to use their phones to pay for goods at stores and we want to be able to do all of this on a decentralized platform that is developed and operated by the community um, 
And so it in turn can be a foundation for a whole range of new services uh, built on top of it. So, you know, apps for managing savings or microfinance and micro lending through to, you know, things that I haven't <laughs> haven't even anticipated yet. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty ambitious mission. It's one that definitely requires us to take a whole stack approach, uh, especially in the crypto space, where we are combining uh, a mobile wallet. You can see a screenshot of that on the right. Um, a smart contract platform where we provide stable value currencies um, so that users don't have to think about like they can uh, transact in currencies which are familiar with them. Um, an identity protocol I just mentioned for sending money directly to mobile phone numbers. Um, uh, and then on top of that, we also need an architecture that's focused on serving like very many mobile clients all at once where those clients probably have like poor um, quality or expensive data connectivity. And so we want to be very like cognizant of that when, uh, when, when, when thinking about the, the protocol. So we, 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 we're trying to build a platform which has like high final, like fast finality, like high throughput um, and uh, operates at a sort of reasonable infrastructure cost. So that is, um, <clears throat> you know, that is a lot of stuff. It's a lot to bite off. Um, we're, foc you know, the focus is very much on um, looking at this from an end user's perspective and making, um, making, I guess a, a platform and then a series of products which are as simple as possible for end users. Um, and, you know, to, to, to do all of that is, is a challenge. Um, to help get there faster, Celo is based on Ethereum. So at the blockchain level, uh, Ethereum is like the starting point that we are going from for the reference implementation of uh, the Celo blockchain. Um, we've made major modifications and are definitely, in de definitely indebted to the Go Ethereum, the Geth community for uh, like you know all all of the like work that they've done and the great starting point in terms of the the code base that has been running out there in production for like several years now. <coughs> so <coughs> so yeah. So what I'm going to do is talk through a bunch of the ways that we have um, made sort of significant modifications to the Ethereum um, platform. Um, and in particular, one of them where we have taken out the entire proof of work scheme and replaced it with a proof of stake scheme and all of the, the sort of changes that that entails. Um, so yeah, so, so I guess in summary, like smartphones are very much at like the heart of this, this, this vision and uh, from an infrastructure perspective, validators are very much at the heart of like the infrastructure that, that, that um, Celo consists of. So you'll see that when we like look at the network topology. So looking at the sort of running components in the Celo network and how they communicate together. So at the middle of this diagram, you'll see um, the validators. We'll come back to those. Uh, we'll come back to those in a second. The most numerous kind of node in the system are the light clients. So um, these are the these are the uh, instances of the Celo blockchain which run on every mobile device. Uh, alongside like a wallet application and uh, the light clients use four nodes, the sort of triangles in the middle of the diagram to answer requests and, uh, uh, you know, answer requests and service transaction data and forward new transactions on their behalf. Um, if you think about it, like the, from a, the perspective of the number of users that are likely to be in the system, versus the sort of limitations we're going to come and talk about in terms of the number of validators. There's like this big discrepancy between the number of users that need supporting and the number of maximum number of validators that um, we're going to be able to support. So the gap there is really around, um, it, like full, we look to full nodes very much to, um, to, to fill this gap in, in the sort of Celo protocol and to make this sort of an operational network. Um, but in Ethereum right now, there are very few incentives to run a full node that is not mining. Basically, a full node is just a node in Ethereum that is has mining disabled. Um, so to address incentives, the uh, Celo protocol incentivizes users to operate um, regular, like these regular non-validator nodes by um, having light clients pay a tra per transaction fee 
to um, the gateway uh, full node that you're talking to. So basically, every, whenever you want to make a transaction, you um, you know you send that along to the nearest full node, and the full node, um, the full node, <coughs> as part of that transaction, the full node actually um, receives some uh, some fees when the transaction is processed and, and mined. So the the analogy I sort of like to think about is is one of a cafe. You know, you can go and sit in a cafe, you can, uh, you know, freeload on their Wi-Fi, you can take up their space and, you know, a slice of their rent. But uh, periodically, you are going to be required to, like, buy a coffee or otherwise you'll get kicked out. And this, this model is very much the same, whereby a market will emerge among full nodes offering different, um, like, prices or qualities of service or in different locations. And we sort of envisage like clients providing the incentives that full nodes need to operate here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so coming back to the validators in the center of the diagram, like several other proof of stake blockchain projects, uh, Celo uses a Byzantine fault tolerant uh, consensus uh, uh, protocol to basically to agree the new blocks that are gonna get added to the end of the blockchain. So validator nodes broadcast uh, signed messages between themselves and uh, even when up to a third of those validators are uh, offline or malicious or faulty or misconfigured in some way we can still reach agreement so long as we have this like um, <coughs> excuse me this um, Byzantine quorum of two-thirds of the validators um, uh, being honest as, as, as the terminology is um, and the signatures of those validators are basically then combined together uh, and that allows, allows other nodes to certify that the new, uh, the new block is valid. So yeah, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more and see, see what that means from a, a sort of setup point of view. You know, so if you were actually running a validator, what would, uh, what would that look like? <clears throat> so it really means operating a setup that looks a bit like this. So if any of you are valid on Cosmos, you will probably be familiar with at least part of this diagram. Um, so first, the validator itself is an instance running the Celo blockchain software. Um, in, uh, in Celo, validators actually have two keys. They have a regular ECDSA key, which is the same essentially as keys that are held in, account keys that are held in Ethereum. So the ECDSA key there is called the validator key. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's also validators also have a BLS key, uh, which we use in the Celo protocol for um, signing the f uh, more or less the hash of the block uh, that is agreed. So um, what that means is that uh, we're able to do a bunch of things like aggregate the signatures from different validators together, and therefore like reduce the space and therefore improve the sync performance for, um, uh, for, for, for these, for, for extending uh, the, for writing new blocks out to the blockchain. Um, so the piece that I um, think will probably be familiar to uh, Cosmos validators here is the proxy setup. So validators have, the key material of validators is obviously uh, very valuable and important from a security point of view. We don't want that exposed to the public internet, if at all possible. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is to hide validators on a private network behind one or more proxy nodes, which essentially look like full nodes to the rest of the network, but channel the validator specific requests um, like back and forth. So validators in Celo have a secure way of uh, communicating with each other such that they only share their IP addresses or the IP addresses of their proxies with each other. They look at the election status and see exactly what's, what's happening there and who they need to be sharing their IP address with. Um, and so that means that we can come up with a sort of somewhat <clears throat> like cloaked setup whereby um, it's much harder to find and attack validators or to conduct a denial of service attack on them. <clears throat> so um, it's a somewhat separate from the regular um, communication of the main network. There is also 
uh, an attestation service here. And so we we hope that validators will run, um, and certainly the, the protocol encourages validators to run a attest attestation service. This is part of the identity protocol, as I mentioned. Uh, there is a separate key that the attestation service holds. But as essentially, the attestation service is, is directly answering requests from a mobile wallet apps, including the seller wallet, to be able to uh, send and, and to, to basically send text messages out uh, to direct SMS out to uh, end users, so that those end users can then return them to the blockchain and thereby demonstrate that they have access to a particular phone number. So we'll come back and look at that um, later. In terms of a setup. Um, Looking very much at having like a validator, a validator will benefit from being uh, in a sort of secure location in a data center. The proxy is an attestation service, potentially um, able to be like you know instances on a Kubernetes cluster or on um, you know a cloud provider somewhere. All right, so proof of stake. So yeah, so let's um, let's look at how you become a validator. But before we before we go and sort of dig into that, um, <coughs> I just want to give a quick recap of proof of work versus proof of stake. Um, this is probably familiar to, to, to many of you. Um, so uh, it is worth sort of talking about a little bit why we moved away from proof of work and over to proof of stake. Um, so in proof of work, nodes compete to solve this computational puzzle, which uh, you know consumes like a large amount of compute power and therefore uh, a large amount of energy. And the chain of blocks accepted as the sort of current one is the one that is longest and um, or more or less longest. Certainly, the one that would cost the most energy to rewrite. So that is the sort of basis of the security of proof of work. Um, you know, it relies on no organization being able to acquire enough like hashing power, as it's called, to be able to outpace the hashing power associated with the sort of um, agreed main chain. So the challenge here is that while you are, of course, getting blocks mined in a proof of work network, um, you're in effect paying for, uh, for miners who are just sort of their presence sort of rarely results in transactions getting processed, but they're um, they're needed in the network to prevent uh, like takeovers, basically, and that is uh, that is like a high price to pay, I think, in terms of uh, like cost, the rewards that are need to accrue to these these miners, and also in terms of like power. One of the really nice things about proof of work is it scales very, very well. It allows any participant to just roll up. Um, it's you know, so-called permissionless in the sense that anyone can just come in, um, mine a block or two, and then go away. And the network doesn't have to think about, like, really doesn't have to think about the security or the um, uptime or the um, uh, deployment model or like the longevity of uh, who the participants running proof of work are, what what the machines look like, or where they are. Um, so so that's like one really nice property. So proof of stake, on the other hand, um, so proof of stake is really <clears throat> two things. I think it's like um, a, basically you have these BFT agreement protocols, which uh, you know I, I mentioned. Proof of stake, I think, is really the way you decide who, like, what participants you allow into the set of validators that are participating in this agreement protocol. Um, and so the, the BFT process itself is actually uh, very compelling when you like look at look at its properties um, up up until the, up until this sort of question arises around like. Well, who participates in in it? So uh, you can tolerate malicious actors, up to a third of them. The only work done in the in a proof of stake system is like valuable work that forwards the uh, progress of the network. You need far, in theory, you need far fewer participants because you don't need to prevent this sort of like fifty one percent attack takeover. Um, so the cost is much lower. You can uh, end up how you 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 
as soon as a set of valid a quorum validators sign a block, you end up with by a, a, a like immediate finality. So your transaction throughput can be higher and um, at lower cost, and certainly at lower um, power consumption. So all of those things are great, except that the algorithms actually really don't scale that well. So you can typically have maybe one to three hundred participants in a proof of in a, in a proof of stake scheme. So um, okay, let me be clear. You can only have at any one time one to three hundred validators actively participating in Byzantine consensus. Now uh, the question is, how do you choose uh, which which those are? Um, and so this is this is the sort of like whole subject that like proof of stake is intended to sort of cover. And I'll talk a little bit here about like how we've gone about like solving that in in Celo. So um, starting on the right of this diagram, we have um, validators. So validators obviously are nodes that are ready to participate in Byzantine Torum consensus. Um, to do that, they need to get elected. Uh, the Celo protocol runs an election once every epoch. That's a certain number of uh, blocks, but is you know going to be approximately one hour in Baklava in the test net, and it's probably a main net. Um, you might envisage that it's going to be uh, approximately like once a day, something like that. Um, and in the election, uh, in the Celo protocol, votes are not made for individual validators; they're made for validator groups. Uh, validator groups have members, so validators are members of a validator group, and every validator needs to become a member of a group in order to get elected. So uh, the other thing to note is that groups order the members that they have. So they, you, you can think of this as um, a election slate, uh, like that sort of list of candidates uh, for an election. A group is a little bit analogous to a party. Uh, and the group will sort of list in order the validators that they want to get elected. And at the election time, if there's sufficient votes for the particular group, maybe zero, one, or more, or all of the validators that the group lists uh, get elected. So yeah, so the group can uh, change, like add, remove, or reorder um, validators at any time. And it's the groups that users vote for. And... Uh, that is that is like sort of an important part of the the, the scheme here. <coughs> so yeah, so if you look at the bottom of this diagram, the little circles with a lock next to them represent what we call like lock to gold. And as a decentralized platform, <coughs> there's really no way of identifying like users per se. So we can only identify accounts. Uh, anyone can generate any number of accounts, of course. So that is like a challenge if you're trying to build a voting system. What they can't do, though, is just generate assets. They can't just like magic currency out of thin air. And so the best thing we know to do is to count currency from the point of view of uh, voting. And then also we need to lock up that currency for a period of time so that the same funds can't be reused to like you know for vote for one candidate and then switched out through a series of accounts and vote for the other one. So the only way we can really do accounting on votes is to require users to lock up their currency, put put it in escrow, and then apply that to voting. So we have this mechanism which we'll come back and talk about in a second called locked gold. That is what you use for for, for participating in validator elections. Um, it is also one way of earning rewards in the Celo protocol. And for groups and validators, the same mechanism is used to lock up a stake. Uh, again, we'll come back and, and talk about that in a sec. So yeah, so um, let's just look at the roles of these three groups in terms of how they make the network secure and highly available. Um, because BFT scales only to a few hundred nodes and can only tolerate a third um, of malicious participants, each validator can have a significant negative effect on the performance and scalability of the net on the security of the network. So you know this is very much in contrast to a proof of work scheme, um, and so we need to be we need to be careful about every validator 
that gets elected. The protocol needs to um, like make sure that every validator that gets in, um, there is as little chance as possible of that validator being malicious or just not um, well managed. And so, as it says here, the network's interests are best served by selecting validators running on secure hardware with good monitoring and undergoing regular audits. And because of this, Celo sort of encourages like this, I guess, so-called professionalization of validators where um, actually we try and apply the uh, best practices of um, operational security where there's good physical data center security, um, monitoring uh, where there's use of hardware wallets, and this is this is this is something that is like important. It, this is the sort of main contribution that a validator and only a validator can really uh, uh, play. So validator groups, on the other hand, um, are there because it's not always possible for users to tell whether a validator is doing all of that stuff. Um, you know, as a user voting for a validator or valid, I, I couldn't t tell whether a validator is actually monitoring their service well, whether they're actually doing key rotation, um, whether they're actually applying the latest security patches to their operating system. Um, but nevertheless, all those things play big factors in like the real security of the network. So this is, in Celo, this is where validated groups come in. Um, so groups will be able and incentivized to build up long-term judgments on their validators' operational security, uh, operational practices and security setups. So yeah, the way we think about this is that validated groups can help mitigate the information disparity between voters and validators. So groups might emerge that do not necessarily operate validators themselves, but um, attract votes for their reputation for ensuring uh, ensuring like the validators have um, a you know the validators have a good security setup and uh, they're in a position to be able to do this because every validator needs to get accepted by a group in order to get elected. Um, groups are expected to be sort of long-lived entities and that relationship is going to mean that they have like better information on the quality of the operator and validator. Um, that's not to say, of course, that validators couldn't also become validator groups. There's a potential benefit in, uh, in, in that too. So, um, so then what is the role of like cello gold holders? Um, the network is secured by voters locking up gold and selecting groups that maximize their rewards and they trust, making the cost of influencing elections prohibitive. So we don't rely on cello gold holders in the cello protocol to uh, necessarily make great decisions about uh, which validators to pick, but I guess we do, um, the protocol does rely on them making the sort of relatively easier decision of selecting a group that performs well and uh, that they trust and, uh, and has a good reputation. So the uh, seller gold holders do earn rewards that um, uh, have so there are like ways of aligning, and we'll come back and look at it, there are ways of aligning the incentives of uh, gold holders to the sort of uh, performance of uh, validators and of the validators in the group that they vote for. But with security, that is much harder. And so that's, that's a, a sort of limitation there. Um, it's also worth highlighting in another way, like one sort of critical factor here uh, in terms of the way rewards to sell gold holders result in network security. By locking up gold and reducing liquidity, uh, from an economics perspective, it's expected to become like prohibitively expensive to purchase large quantities of sell gold to elect malicious validators. And so, you know, in some senses here, the, the role that sell gold holders play in this piece is that they lock up in exchange they earn rewards, and because of that, it's very difficult for others to acquire um, enough currency to swing an election. Okay, so the th we have this locked gold mechanism. When one of the one of the uh, one of the nice things about it is that you can uh, use locked gold for several different purposes all at once. So you know the first we've talked about is like voting for validator groups. 
Um, it's also a me the mechanism by which you put up a stake. If you're a validator, want to register a validator or, or register a validator group. Uh, and then we, Stellar also has a on-chain uh, governance mechanism whereby you can vote to approve or uh, vote against proposals to change the actual protocol itself. Um, and so the interesting thing here is that if you have locked gold, you can do all of these things all at once. So if you're a validator, you can vote using your stake for yourself or maybe for someone else um, and earn rewards on that. And you can also use that stake to participate in on-chain governance as well. So just quickly look at the flow of uh, locked gold and um, what, what that process actually sort of looks like. Look at the sort of life cycle there. Um, so this account on the left hand side can uh, take some of its balance and lock that up. Um, and then, so that's the uh, piece in the middle. And then they can take uh, any gold they've locked up and use it to vote for a group subject to that group being able to accept votes. We'll come back and look at that in a second. So that vote then counts immediately towards the next election that happens on the boundary of the epoch, um, but it's actually marked pending for rewards. Uh, and so, you know, we come forward, we have the next epoch and election runs, the votes say, the votes that that um, user uh, cast caused this validator down here to get elected. That's great. What that means is that the user can then activate the vote, which puts it into a pool where the rewards on that gold continue to compound. So, um, you know, at the end of the epoch, rewards get earned, put back, applied to the same pool uh, of votes for the same group, so that um, you know your your sort of voting weight is heavier. The uh, uh, and, and the rewards that you get next time will be automatically compounding on uh, the, that complete value there. At some point later, you might decide to unvote. You can withdraw some or all of those uh, voting funds and they go back into your sort of locked gold pot. Uh, at that point, you can then go and immediately vote for another group or you can choose to unlock uh, some or all of those funds. Now, when you unlock, there is a unlocking period of three days uh, before the, the gold can be transferred back to you. So you unlock and then you transfer back th up, you know, three days later. And the reason for that period is we want it to be high enough that um, the uh, gold that is being unlocked is not still, was not still a factor in getting any validator elected. So remember that elections happen every day and that you could potentially, uh, if you could unlock your gold and withdraw it and do something else with it immediately, you could potentially um, acquire gold, uh, contribute to a vote and then get it out again before doing something malicious in the network. And obviously we don't want that. On the other hand, we wanted that period to be short enough for it not to present much of a sort of liquidity risk for end users. And we felt that three days is, is sort of an appropriate balance there. Um, and so then let's look at how elections actually happen. So we use a form of proportional representation uh, to, 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 to do elections. Um, the, basically, this, uh, this works by, you can see in this diagram here, we've got a bunch of different groups and uh, a bunch of different, like, um, a bunch of different sort of numbers of votes received, and then a, a, a cap as well. So let's 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 look at look at that cap. So um, elections in Celo sort of differ from real world elections in that they're trying to translate um, voter preferences into uh, sort of some form of representation, but a really trying to sort of maintain this moat around existing well-performing validators. Um, I think if you think about it, the, the, the sort of what elections are doing is really preventing this attack whereby uh, you can think, what is the minimum amount of gold that I'm going to need to be able to get a malicious validator elected? And if you think of a sort of regular election where the votes are skewed very heavily towards like 
a small number of participants, that is not particularly like helpful in a sense, because if you've got a fixed um, number of validators, well, it's really just the number of votes received by your um, least supported validator that got elected last time that you need to displace in order to get your malicious validator elected. And so um, we, have this, we have this notion of a cap on the number of votes that a group can receive, which is really like one more than the number of votes, um, or it's basically the number of votes that would be needed to elect one more validator than the, the group currently has. And what that cap does is it means that in some instances, gold holders will be forced to go and vote for a different group than perhaps they initially wanted. Um, but it does mean that the sort of pattern of votes received is going to be much more like flat and therefore it's much more likely that um, it's much more likely that the amount of gold that you need to get a malicious validator elected would be much would be higher therefore increasing like the security of the network um, so yeah it's worth saying that there is a limit on the size of groups as well. Groups in uh, the back of a testnet can have five validators. And this is really to like make the network less centralized and more secure. Really just meaning that we trying to avoid too much uh, voting power or operating risk centralizing itself in any one entity. Feel, you know, five out of a hundred validators felt like a roughly um, roughly right sort of amount for that. So yeah, so in terms of the actual election, um, basically the, uh, I mean, in short, like uh, validating, cello gold holders vote for groups, and then uh, the first valid, like the sort of election proceeds in order, the first slot in the election is given to the validator whose group receives most votes, and the validator at the top of the list for that group and then basically at each step, the next validator that gets elected is the highest ranked validator that has not yet been elected in the group who, where um, electing it would sort of maximize the average votes received over that group's validator. So you can sort of think of it as a choice like, do we elect the second validator from this first group because they receive so many votes or should we elect the first validator from this other group? And the, the trade-off there is just like looking at the average number of votes that would be received um, across that group if that, that vote were elected and just trying to maximize that. Um, cool. Okay, so looking at uh, epoch rewards. So this is sort of a uh, variation on the familiar notion of uh, block rewards, basically minting and distributing new units of cello gold as blocks are produced. And the aim here, of course, is to create several kinds of incentives to secure the network um, and, you know, incentivize participation. Um, so epoch rewards are paid in the final block of the epoch, so typically at the end of every day. Um, since there is a fixed supply of cello gold, um, you can read more about that in the cello white paper, the protocol has this like target schedule on which additional tokens are minted and um, that allows the protocol to maintain epoch rewards like long into the future. As you'll see, that there are some cases in which uh, we need to, uh, like, where we don't need to give out. The protocol doesn't need to give out as many uh, as many units for, of epoch rewards as at other times, uh, and so there can be situations where we are sort of spending below this target, and situations where the uh, rewards are getting dispersed faster than this target. And so one of the things that we have is this notion of like tr basically tracking to this target schedule and you know at times that we are underspending the protocol boosts payments and in times when it's overspending it sort of tightens its purse strings and uh, reduces spending proportionally. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that in, uh, in, in, a, in a moment. Um, so just to look at the recipients of uh, Epoch Rewards, various different groups here um, have, have, have claim to them. So validators and validator groups. So there is a, a, a reward for validators, which factors in a bunch of things. We'll look at that in a minute. And then validator groups receive their um, 
uh, rewards, as I think I mentioned earlier, from this notion of a group share, where they sort of just take a slice uh, of the reward of the validator. So you can think of this as sort of like a commission, where the at the point that the validator adds itself into the group, that is like sort of part of the implicit contract between the group and the validator, that, hey, being part of this group is going to cost you this particular particular percentage. Um, locked gold holders. So worth noting that uh, rewards are only received by locked gold holders that vote for a group that in that epoch elects a validator, one or more validators. So uh, we'll, we'll come back to think about the uh, consequences of that in a second. And then there are several other um, you know, targets for uh, logged gold that <clears throat> I'm not going to really talk too much about, but just to mention that they exist. Um, there's a community fund which can be used by governance proposal to disperse funds to keep up like the um, development of the protocol and uh, improve documentation and uh, fix issues and so on. There's a carbon offsetting fund, which, which again, controlled by governance, but where the, uh, the intention is that the funds received by the carbon offsetting fund will offset the total carbon output by all validators and uh, nodes in the network such that the, the network is uh, carbon neutral. And then finally, there's the reserve. So we mentioned there are obviously like uh, stable value tokens. So the stable coins that Celo supports have a reserve backing it. Normally that manages itself, the that's the anticipation at least. Um, but uh, there is this mechanism here that if in, in an event that, in the rare event that the sort of reserve is under collateralized by the other mechanisms it has, at its disposal to m manage that collateral, the the reserve can also be the recipient of a number of epoch rewards to bolster it. Cool. Okay. So looking at how we make rewards to validators and validator groups. So um, one thing that's interesting here is that. Um, uh, epoch rewards to validators and validator groups are. Uh, denominated in cello dollars, so in the stable currency. Uh, one of the reasons for that is we sort of it's anticipated that most of the expenses of validators and validated groups will be um, uh, defrayed in like fiat currencies. Like if you think of hosting bills or salaries for um, people managing uh, managing machines or software licenses. Uh, and so this makes the whole sort of process a lot more predictable. Of course, once you've received, if you're a validator and you receive cello dollars, you can always exchange them for cello gold if that is uh, what you want to do. But the idea here really is that this makes the process of understanding the returns from being a validator much more predictable. So uh, we're setting that at a, at a certain level. We're still finalizing exactly what these parameters are. It's worth saying they're all gonna be able to be changed by governance. But the idea is that it's going to be more than high enough to present sort of an attractive margin on like running a, um, I guess, professionalized sort of validator outfit, right? So the idea of if you want to run a, a machine and have it in a uh, like modern hardware and a good colo facility and, you know, take the time to do monitoring well, that doesn't come for free. And we, uh, the pro I think the project, uh, I hope that the initial values that are set in the protocol um, like sort of reflect that. So the second piece is that, you know, I mentioned that we have the spending versus target factor. Um, so that, that sort of reward will be either boosted or potentially uh, cut by a certain percentage based on whether we're um, tracking to our, um, tracking to our sort of spending target. Perhaps you would expect that it doesn't change very much. Um, and then there's a series of deductions uh, around things that validators can do less well. <laughs> um, so the first is a slashing penalty. Uh, I'll come and talk a bit about that uh, when we get on to slashing. Uh, the second is an uptime score. So uh, validators' rewards do factor in validator uptime. And we'll look at how that's calculated on the next slide. And then there's this group share. Uh, so where the group takes a certain proportion of what's remaining and then the validator takes the rest.
and sort of like the way that um, rewards and uh, for validators and groups are calculated. So let's look at validator uptime. Um, what we're doing here is uh, basically tracking an uptime score for each validator. And the way we do this is that um, as every block gets produced, you see here going from left to right, we're including the signatures of the validators uh, that signed the previous block. And the reason for this is it allows us not to have to wait. Um, there's some subtlety around like incentives for producing blocks in a timely fashion. Um, and we, uh, so we get around this by basically adding signatures for the previous block to the block that gets proposed in the next round. And um, so you see in the first uh, column on the left, a red block gets produced and then all the validators that end up signing the red block have their signature added to the subsequent purple block. And then basically we track a sliding window of these signatures and so long as you've had your, um, in the back of the test net at least, like the parameter we're sort of starting with is probably 12. So long as you've had your signature included at least once in the last 12 blocks, uh, that counts as being up. And so what that means is that like downtime of like less than a minute is like just not considered by the protocol, but then after downtime of more than a minute in a, in succession, uh, the the sort of your uptime score begins to uh, begins to sort of fall after that point. And so then there's a bunch of so it's not quite as simple as just counting like these periods. There's a few other things to factor in, but basically you end up with an uptime score of between like zero and one, and uh, that. Um, that like factors in to the uh, rewards that we saw on the previous slide and it also factors in to the rewards uh, for locked gold holders as well that elect uh, that elect um, a group so let's let's go and take a take a look at that um, so the the difference really for locked gold holders is that if you recall what we're really trying to do is lock up, with lock gold, we're trying to lock up the right amount of the circulating gold supply so that it's very hard for an attacker to purchase large amounts of gold um, and then swing the election. So to do that, we actually dynamically set the rewards that locked gold receives based on uh, the proportion of... Um, the sort of supply of cello gold um, that is locked and voting. So as, like, you know, if there's too much cello gold circulating uh, and not enough locked and voting, then we'll dynamically increase the rewards to lock gold until that level of locking and voting goes up, at which point we'll bring it back down a little. And so the idea here is to, like, create a good balance between liquidity and security. So um, that level results in a sort of on-target reward, which is like a percentage uh, on on the sort of the, the hold on the holdings. Um, worth noting that um, you only receive locked gold on amounts of locked gold that are a voting, b activated, and c voting for a group that elected one or more validators in this epoch. So a few consequences of that. If you lock your gold and you don't vote, that's no good, because um, of course it doesn't help the protocol. If you lock your gold and vote but don't activate, well, uh, unfortunately as an implementation detail you need to do that, so that's also no good. <laughs> um, and then the final thing is, it doesn't actually matter whether you elect one valid, you vote for a group that elects one validator or many, just so long as you vote for a group that uh, vote that, that, that gets at least one validator in. So, and it's worth noting the rewards are not tied in any way to the rewards for, for, or they're not subject or dispersed through validators. They're, they're hand, these rewards are handed out directly through the protocol to locked gold holders. So, there are a couple of factors of what the group and its validators do that affect the rewards to, to, to lock gold holders. 
Um, slashing penalty, we'll come back and look at in a second again. Um, but also the average uptime score of the validators that got elected in the group that you voted for. So, you know, if you've uh, voted for a group and there's three validators in it that got elected and one has a perfect uptime score of one and one has 0 0.8 and one has 0 0.9, then the average will come out at 0 0.9 and that is like a factor on the rewards that you receive. So log gold holders do have an incentive to vote for groups that um, have validators that are highly available and do not do bad things. Um, because of the slashing penalty. So yeah, let's uh, come on and talk talk a little bit about penalties. This um, is the, the the team working on Cello is still flashing out some of the details around this, um, but I just wanted to sort of give a, a like a, a high level high level view on this and um, definitely appreciate input from the community about like how uh, how how we go about setting these things. Remember that virtually all of this is. Uh, implemented in smart contracts and so uh, is governable as well on an ongoing basis through the on-chain governance mechanism. So the consequences of penalties like vary. There's basically three tools that the, pen the protocol has um, to sort of do things when um, validators act um, in a way that's not conducive to the good performance of the protocol. The first is that the first is basically like getting ejected. So the validator can uh, remove, uh, the, the, the protocol can remove the validator from the group. And that's effective the next epoch. Nothing changes ever within an epoch. So at the end of the next day, the validator basically uh, is no longer sort of standing for election. And so what that means is that the validator, in order to, the validator can try and get elected again immediately, but the group has to re-add them. So of course it's up to the group to decide whether it's, uh, whether it's going to do that. Um, the second thing is that the validator and group can each lose a fixed amount of their stake. Um, that is something which uh, exists in other protocols and I think is uh, something that we want to use uh, in the Celo protocol probably, um, probably sparingly. Uh, but it definitely carries carries an incentive. And the third thing is like a slashing penalty, whereby uh, you can, uh, the slashing penalty is like a factor, as you've just seen, on the rewards for both validators, for validator groups, and for uh, locked gold holders who voted for that group. And so the slashing penalty is like a reduction in future rewards. It doesn't remove a stake. It doesn't like cause it to do anything else, but what it does is it means that your rewards for all of those uh, candidates are basically halved um, for the next 30 days. And if a, another sort of slashing event occurs, then the penalty is further halved and the timer resets such that like you've got to wait another 30 days before rewards go back to normal. So one thing to note here is that the locked gold holders do not put up a stake and their uh, the amount that they vote or the amount of gold that they lock up is never like at risk in the sense that it's never subject to slashing. The only, uh, the only components that are subject to slashing are the stake that the validator and the group put up. Um, so yeah, so several categories of like offense. So double signing, I think we're, we're sort of figuring out exactly what type of double signing and exactly how we um, uh, how we go. There's a lot of subtleties in here, but broadly, if uh, if the we're, we're we're planning not to, uh, you know, the, the current the current proposals from the development team are that we would not uh, be looking necessarily to. Uh, penalize double signing at every single level in the consensus protocol, but just if you sign with your BLS key two blocks um, at the same height uh, with different parent hashes, i.e. there's uh, basically very crisp um, evidence that either uh, you're doing something malicious or in very, very rare circumstances could this happen, I guess, through misconfiguration, but we, we don't expect that. Um, so that would be um, that would be that would be one thing, and we need to the the protocol does need to penalise for this in some sense to avoid the nothing at stake uh, problem. So uh, 
uh, persistent downtime. So I think the penalty here is most likely to be uh, just ejecting the validator from the group. We don't necessarily want to like dock stake, I think, for uh, validators that are persistent, that are persistently down. We just want to ensure that they do not contribute towards um, unavailability of the network. And then the final thing is that there, it is possible in Celo to slash uh, or re remove, uh, like eject validators from groups or to um, uh, dock stake by uh, governance proposal. So the, the idea here is that if, um, if you know precisely, very, if there are very, very prescribed, I guess, offenses against the validator, then it's possible for malicious actors to figure out attacks that sidestep those very precise categories of, of offense. And the idea here is that governance is a mechanism whereby the community can vote on, yes, you clearly did a very bad thing and we're going to dock a part of your stake here. So we'll obviously set the parameters for this to be very high and make this like relatively difficult to do, set the, set the burden of proof quite high. Um, but I, I see this as more like the sort of impeachment um, type route. Uh, finally, asset stations. So, yeah, so Cello has this identity protocol whereby uh, we allow users to of, of the Cello wallet app to, um, you know, give the app um, permission to read their contacts, and then users can send money directly between uh, between users just on the basis of their mobile phones, phone numbers. And to do that, um, the Cello protocol needs to maintain a mapping of uh, these numbers to account addresses, essentially. It's a little more complicated than that. But the role that validators have in this is that we need um, some entity in the system to be able to uh, direct SMS messages uh, to users such that they can use those SMS messages to prove that they have access to a device. And so this is where the attestation service comes in and is a uh, part of um, like uh, is a me is part of the mechanism that uh, that we hope validators will will, will run, and it's also a uh, source of uh, funding and rewards for validators too. So just to quickly step through this, how how this works. So the wallet requests attestations from the smart contract um, uh, through a source of on-chain randomness. The wallet basically gets handed out a random selection of validators um, in order to, like, typically several to uh, go to, to, to basically to go and ask to send attestations on its behalf. And this, like, these are randomly selected to avoid collusion here. When you request attestations, you pay a fee, and what that means is then um, that that fee is available to be handed out to all of the. Uh, like attestation services that participate or can be shown to participate here. So the wallet then contacts the attestation service directly. This is not as part of like the regular blockchain protocol, but is a just a sort of HTTP call. Um, the the wallet requests from the val from the attestation service of the appropriate validators. Hey, please, can you go and um, this is my phone number. Please, can you send me signed messages um, that attest to my uh, uh, attestation request? And then the validator uses a SMS provider to do that. The uh, signed attestation message is sent via SMS, and then the wallet receives it back. And then, in order to basically show that uh, uh, show that it's actually has has access to this number and has received those, the wallet then basically lodges these completed attestation messages with the smart contract. The attestation is completed at that point and the validators, who the, all the validators um, that have sent messages or like, or at least have for which the wallet has received messages are uh, then uh, basically rewarded uh, a certain fixed amount, which uh, more than covers their cost. So this is, uh, this is it, like gonna be an important part of um, making the uh, Celo protocol something which is um, 
very easy to use for end users and it's definitely I think in the broader interest of the network and of like adoption of Celo to uh, have these attestation services be run well and that's why in the initial rev we made uh, I think you know the team made the decision to uh, like have uh, have validators play a part in in this okay great so Coming to the end of the, uh, of the of the content now, I just wanted to sort of highlight a few of, I guess, my suggestions for um, figuring out Celo and uh, getting to the point where you can run a successful validator on mainnet. So I think the first thing is to like learn the protocol. As with any uh, decentralized system or any any blockchain, uh, like these things are complicated. We are going to try and uh, certainly try and do our best uh, in the seller community to make this as simple and straightforward as possible and build as many resources. But like it's an active conversation. It would be great um, to receive your input on feedback on what we're doing here, but also uh, to, to, um, for, for you to all contribute as well in terms of uh, and the, I think the first step to that is really just like taking the time to understand the protocol and understand its nuances um, so that you know what's what's expected and that you understand the potential rewards uh, and penalties and, and so on. The second thing in terms of actually getting set up as a validator is to pick a secure provider, pick a good provider. Um, I think that... Uh, ju just deploying validators on a cloud service is probably not going to be like the best route forward for the network. Uh, so I think like trying to like trying to find providers which offer like the right level of security, the right level of support and service for you, I think is uh, an important part of the process. The next step is making like just getting set up uh, in and getting that set up done in a way which sort of reflects the best practices. Um, we can talk a lot more about that, but like broadly having proxies, having good monitoring, um, having like uh, operating system, like recent patch levels on operating systems, not having like um, uh, wide open uh, ports and just you know having uh, intruder detection systems like a bunch of uh, a bunch of things there um, just out of like the set, sort of DevOps best practices handbook I think is is really what we're what, 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 what would what would work well but part of this is also making this repeatable so that uh, because one of the opportunities is of course like that you don't just run one validator instance but it's once you've done the work to figure out one, it's often is possible uh, uh, and to, to, to run more than one. And in any case, when you rotate keys or you need to m change hardware, you're going to want to make this process repeatable. And so using tools that help you uh, deploy, uh, deploy services easily and treat these validators and especially treat these proxies more like uh, cattle rather than pets, I think is like a good route to go down. Uh, the next step is like deploying attestation service and maybe a full node or two uh, is a way of uh, broadening your sort of reach in the cello network and also broadening like the uh, streams of rewards and income that you can receive from, uh, from, from, from these. So full nodes, as I mentioned, receive fees for um, forwarding transactions into the network. Attestation service receives fees from uh, forwarding SMS on users' behalf. Then there's a the question of groups. So you could either join a group. Uh, there's nothing to say you can't start a group. I think the best time to do that is during the stake-off. Um, I think if you start a group, you'll want to be thinking about like how to build differentiation. That might be about building expertise or tooling uh, on the seller network or just generally establishing yourself as a uh, as and as, building a reputation as like a organization for who for which voters can like basically trust uh, to put um, to put, put put their vote in and so you know maybe I think having groups that are big on doing security audits or big on providing support to other validators to get started um, is an interesting model you can come up maybe a, a model that will emerge 
is one of sort of groups providing mentorship to validators uh, or providing uh, a sort of cooperative uh, mechanism to, uh, to get people started. And the final thing is that unlike other networks, you can vote, into some other networks at least, you can vote with your stake. So make sure you do that um, and you know, help secure the network and receive rewards through that mechanism as well. Great. Well, um, I I know this is like complicated, uh, co complicated stuff, and um, certainly for um, eight a.m. Pacific time is definitely a little intense. So I appreciate all of you like hanging, uh, hanging through uh, through it with me. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate your your time and looking forward to continuing to like continuing the conversation with all of you on the forum about about this and. Do we do definitely? I, I, I really appreciate your feedback about uh, aspects of the design that you've been thinking about, questions you have, stuff which is not clearly explained, and uh, yeah, also really looking forward to the great Cello Stake Off. And uh, I, I hope you'll all be participating and see you there. <laughs>